A single nation dominating about half of an entire continent's landmass, having a huge population, boundless nature and resources, and despite having been colonized in the past, by now this nation has far eclipsed its mother nation. This nation is clearly set up for a great future, and their resources and population will carry them to success. Of course this didn't happen, since I'm talking about Brazil, but you knew that from the title and the thumbnail. Instead of the great future that may have been possible, Brazil is now economically weak and unequal, riddled with corruption, and in the great game of nations they are punching well below their weight. But what if that changed? By all means, Brazil could have been a successful country. So what caused Brazil to reach the weak state it's in today? Why isn't Brazil amongst the Europeans and Americans as one of the most influential nations in the world? And what if it was? But first some history. Why is Brazil so weak? We all know the traditional explanations for the former Spanish states in Latin America. The Spanish were horrible overlords, fostering division and dependency upon Spain, while curtailing economic development and autonomy in the colonies if it didn't directly benefit the Spanish homeland. This meant that apart from the Spanish colonies already being economically weak upon independence, especially after often having to fight some pretty costly independence wars, this also meant that they were lacking a responsible local elite set up to take power. But none of this applies to Brazil, since as most of you know, they were colonized by Portugal, not Spain. Brazil's issues can be traced back not just, but primarily, to their elite class. After Brazil got independence from Portugal in 1822, its future was undecided. It had a lot of troubles to look after, and colonization by the Portuguese wasn't necessarily great for the young nation, but there certainly was potential. But infighting among the young nation's elite, and issues with the monarchy, started the nation down a negative road. Brazil's independence was caused by Portugal trying to reassert itself over Brazil, while Brazil was an autonomous entity within the Kingdom of Portugal, Brazil and the Algarves. Brazil then faced a difficult first decade of independence, with monarchists, separatists and republicans fighting it out in several wars and rebellions. And to make matters worse, Pedro I, Brazil's first emperor, abdicated the throne, leaving it to his five-year-old son, Pedro II. This power vacuum caused even more conflicts in the young nation, as a five-year-old is not ready to rule. Then the elites of Brazil were an agricultural-based upper class. Even worse for the development of the economy, they were a slave-holding upper class. Slavery in itself is obviously a horrific thing for the people involved, and a great injustice on humanity's record. But for our story today, slavery is also bad for the development of your economy. Slavery disincentivizes innovation, increases in productivity, and industrialization. It essentially steers your economy to remain stuck in an agricultural state, since non-slaveholding agriculture struggled to compete with the elite-backed slave plantations, and the slaveholding elites fight tooth and nail to hold back industrialization in an effort to keep their own power. Because industrialization causes a new, capitalist-based upper class to come into existence, something the old elites have little need for. The issue of slavery was perhaps the single worst factor for Brazil's development. Brazil, by some estimates, took about 40% of the total amount of slaves transported from Africa to the Americas. Even worse for Brazil, while one by one the European and the American countries were finally removing much of the evil that came from the cruel institution, Brazil kept it, quite literally, up to the final moment. Spanish America had mostly removed slavery during their wars of independence, and by far most of them had abolished it during the 1850s. Then there was obviously the United States, who, at least officially, ended slavery in the 1860s. There were some stragglers, but these were very minor Spanish colonies of Cuba and Puerto Rico. But Brazil was the very last nation to abolish slavery. Only in 1888 did Brazil, as not just the final major nation to do so, but the final nation in the Western world to do so. But back to the monarchy. Emperor Pedro II, upon actually coming of age, was a good ruler. He led Brazil into becoming a moderately powerful state and economy, and a rising power on the world stage, especially in comparison to the rest of Latin America. But there was one thing about the monarchy that even Pedro himself found unacceptable. Pedro's only male heir had died in 1850. Pedro did have daughters, and the Brazilian constitution allowed for female ruler, but, to put it mildly, Neither the Brazilian elite nor Pedro itself thought it was a good idea to have a female empress. It didn't help that Pedro's daughter Isabella didn't seem to be all too interested in rulership either. This state of affairs was fine from 1850 to 1880. Pedro continued to rule the nation in a successful manner for as long as his health was fine. 
But when he got old and his health started to decline, Pedro became less and less interested in leadership. He felt that the monarchy was destined to fall after his death, and this apathy by Pedro caused a small but strong republican faction to coup the nation. Which leads us to one of the strangest coups in history. Despite having the support of most of the Brazilian peoples and elites, the republicans managed to coup the monarchy, and Pedro was so apathetic to the entire affair that it has been said that if Pedro wasn't the emperor himself, most would think that he was collaborating with the coup. Which leads us to the birth of the Brazilian Republic. This republic started out as a military dictatorship and then descended into a corrupt presidential system. Most of the population was barred from voting and through a corrupt system the land-owning elite traded around the presidency and governorships of the nation. Ironically, the Brazilian monarchy was much more democratic than the Brazilian Republic that followed it. These decades of corrupt rule of the elites only further weakened and weakened the Brazilian situation, ensuring that the Brazilians entered the early 20th century as a weak state and economy, which they never quite managed to recover from. If we are to make Brazil into a prosperous nation, this first century and the reign of Pedro II is the most crucial to change. Preventing the Republic from rising would be the single most important change we can make, since preventing slavery has way too many side effects. Changing this first century of independence will give us a solid foundation upon which we can build a powerful Brazil. So let's take another look at Pedro II. Pedro II was an effective monarch. He was a moderate, beloved by the Brazilian people, he had a steady base with the Brazilian elites, and he was, thanks to his honor, patience, and a willingness to compromise, capable of pushing through even controversial decisions like the abolition of slavery. Pedro II was by all means an extraordinary ruler. But, like mentioned before, towards the end of his reign, Pedro stopped caring about governing. In essence, sexism may have been a primary cause for Brazil's downfall. Because Pedro II didn't think that his daughter, or more honestly, a woman in general, was a fit for future rulership, he faltered in his duties in the final decade of his reign, leading to the corrupt republic and leading Brazil down the path of her own timeline. Perhaps if things were different and Pedro's male heir, Pedro Alfonso, had lived to see the 1890s, Brazil would have been completely different. When Pedro would have started to get older, he would have someone to defer to. Pedro II could slowly start taking over some duties from his father while he was still alive, and Pedro II could have faith that through his male heir, the monarchy could survive. We will not change Brazilian history much further than that. We could say, oh yeah, Pedro II also fixed all the other issues during his reign, but that seems like a bit of a cop-out. What made Pedro II's reign great was his compromising nature. It is unrealistic to make Pedro II into a figure that would call the land-owning elites in the short term. The most important thing within Pedro's reign is that slavery is indeed abolished. From this point forward in 1888, Brazil was the most powerful nation in South America. They were a rising economy, they had political stability, they had a limited democracy, and things were generally looking up for the nation. So, now that we have averted military dictatorship and a corrupt dictatorship, Pedro III, when he gains the throne, will enjoy large universal support as the new emperor. Slavery has already been abolished, and Pedro III will now have the job of culling the land-owning elites during his reign. He doesn't have to kill them all, but he needs to steadily reduce their power in such an extent that industrialization and competitive agriculture can develop. This can be done slowly over time. Pedro II will have already been involved with governing ever since he reached adulthood, ramping up when Pedro II gets older, and finally gaining the throne when he was about 40. Pedro III will have decades to push through more reforms and get Brazil to where he wants it to go. Now, here is where I need to mention that Pedro III died when he wasn't even two years old. Why is this important? Because it means that I can't be realistic in any fashion when it comes to him. We don't know how he would have developed after childhood. We don't know how smart, ambitious, ideological or religious he would have been. This gives us immense freedom in what we want him to be in this alternate history, but sadly, it also limits the realism of the scenario, since Pedro III can become anything the author of the scenario wants him to be. But we will allow Pedro III to, broadly, continue his father's reign. He will be compromising, working to ensure that the elites don't exploit the nation too much, democracy remains in place, and Brazil keeps a powerful international position. Essentially, Brazil continues on the moderate course set by Pedro II. Over time, the Brazilian import and export markets will start to grow, agriculture will probably always remain one of the greatest sectors of the Brazilian economy, 
but especially in southern Brazil, there is potential for an industrial push further modernizing and diversifying the Brazilian economy. How Brazil under Pedro III develops in detail is impossible to say, but there is, fundamentally, no reason that Brazil can't keep on developing in a slow and steady manner. There is a constitution, there is a form of democracy, there is political stability, and there is economic progress. Brazil is in great shape for the future. But here we need to discuss something. Broadly speaking, we now have a modern, rich, and rapidly growing Brazil. A powerful state, ready to spread its influence abroad. But we have one problem, its population. Brazil's population at the time was extremely small for the size of the nation. We can pretend like this ultimate Brazil can become a superpower and compete with nations like the United States during the early 20th century. But this is extremely unrealistic. In 1900, Brazil had about 18 million people. The UK, despite its small size, had 30. France had 40, Germany had 55, and the United States had a whopping 75 million. Why do I mention all this? Because these were the developed superpowers of the time, not even counting the populations of their overseas colonies and dominions. Assuming Brazil would be equally developed as these other nations, which even in this timeline they wouldn't fully be, Brazil would still be slightly behind these others, then Brazil would still, thanks to their population, be massively weaker. Brazil may have a couple million more in this alternate timeline, and their population will certainly grow quicker over time, since a richer and more stable Brazil would be more interesting for migrants, especially in southern Europe, but most migrants at the time will still prefer the United States as the more attractive alternative. This leaves us in a difficult spot. We have a powerful Brazil, and a local powerhouse for sure, but it's just not superpower material in the early 20th century, thanks to its lacking population. All of this means that I don't think there would be sweeping changes in the fabric of world history, thanks to a more powerful Brazil. Brazil wasn't too actively involved in most major wars during the time frame that we changed. There also seems to be little incentive for Brazil to go on sweeping conquests of the South American continent. The nation is already larger than it has any need to be, with too few people to actually utilize the land. Conquering more of the Amazon barely has any use for Brazil. Striking down into Argentina and Uruguay may be more useful in terms of land conquered, but would it be worth the military cost and international condemnation it would cause? I doubt it. None of this means that Brazil isn't important in the 20th century in its alternate timeline. Brazil would develop a healthy relation with the United States and the United Kingdom for economic reasons. Brazil would also become the front runner of Latin America, much like it was in the 90th century of our own timeline. In a continent full of unstable republics, Brazil would stand out as a strong constitutional monarchy. For reasons given before, Brazil would use this power as an economic, political and diplomatic position of strength not an expansionist one. Brazil would likely participate in at least the naval conflict in the Atlantic in both the First and the Second World Wars, fighting on the side of the Entente and the Allies respectively. This would be done for both economic and political motives. The United States and the United Kingdom are undoubtedly Brazil's biggest trading partner, and Germany blowing up Brazilian merchant ships would be very bad for business. But Brazilian involvement would not massively change the course of these wars. During the Cold War, Brazil would be somewhere between a neutral nation and an American-aligned nation. They are strong and isolated enough from the communist threat, so they don't need to rely on America for protection. But Brazil would still have developed into a democratic constitutional monarchy, meaning that ideologically speaking, there would still be a massive overlap between the United States and Brazil, much more than between Brazil and the communists. Brazil would speak out against controversial US actions in Latin America. The Cold War would see Brazil reach its peak in terms of power projection, as Latin American nations see Brazil as a reasonable and less assertive alternative to American power. American power projection into the Americas would have to take on a much more careful approach, since Brazil is more than capable of taking on much of the political and economic role of the United States if the United States oversteps its boundaries and alienates the Latin American states by treating them as puppets, enemies or economic dependencies. But where Brazil, thanks to its location, multiculturalism and history, could really shine when compared to the Americans and Europeans, is in cooperation with the African continent, where America and Europe are seen with a bit of distrust, and the Americans and the Europeans themselves mostly view the continent with apathy as long as they don't turn communist, Brazil could step up as a big regional power on at least the west coast of the continent. Brazil doesn't have to worry about the stigma of colonization. 
and Brazil has literally hundreds of millions of Afro-Brazilians, which in this timeline are wealthy enough to sponsor investments, industry, agriculture, and trade in Africa. Brazil would be the diplomatic powerhouse of the global south, a beacon of multiculturalism, trade, democracy, and monarchism. So, all in all, this sounds like quite a boring scenario, and if we look at a world map, quite literally nothing has changed. The main changes in this scenario would be contained within the nations itself. Brazil would now be a large centralized state instead of the federation it became. Brazil as a wealthy nation would also have less incentive to clear out the Amazon rainforest. Brazil would be a worldwide example of how to treat the earth, since they would have the single largest protected nature zone in the entire world. Unless something drastic happens, Brazil would have likely remained a constitutional monarchy during this time, meaning that, at least for the Western world, Brazil would have the only emperor, which is kind of cool as well. But, much like the European nations, Brazil would have become more and more democratic as the emperor starts to take a backseat in politics. But that's where I'll conclude this scenario. It may have been more of a dive into early Brazilian history than a clear alternate history scenario, but I hope that you all enjoyed it nonetheless. I have thought long and hard about major changes in world history that may have come about thanks to Brazil becoming a superpower, but I just couldn't find any. If you do have some, please let me know in the comments. To support the content, consider subscribing, since a new alternate history video will release every Sunday, as well as other videos throughout the week if I have the time to complete them. To help this video grow, please like and comment anything you want, as engagement really helps to boost the video against the YouTube algorithm. Even just commenting something simple like hi helps massively. And a major shout out to these patrons who make it possible for me to dedicate more and more of my time to making videos. By becoming a patron, you get early access to all of my videos the second I complete them myself. And as an added bonus, you get added to this awesome animation. Check out the link in the description if interested. And again, thank you for watching and goodbye.